Hi, my name is Steve James, and welcome back to this audio class on how to read the Bible for understanding and power. This is the More Abundant Life Podcast, episode number 343, How the Bible Interprets Itself, part 2. In the last episode, we learned how the Bible interprets itself right in the verse where it is written. In this episode, we're going to look at examples of how the Bible interprets itself in the context or where it has been previously used. And finally, we're going to look at figures of speech in the Bible. The scripture interprets itself also in the context, which is the whole story or the whole record. This is how young students, like in grade school, learn. They learn the meaning of new words. They learn the meaning of new words by, there's a word, they don't know what it means. And so they read the context around it, and they go, oh, that's what the word means. In God's word, sometimes as we're reading a verse, we might not understand what it's talking about. But if we read the context, then we'll understand what, the, what it's talking about. It'll give us the meaning of the word, which is pretty neat. As you read the context of God's word, you can say, oh, I understand. It's the same thing. Go to Matthew chapter 13, and I'll show you how this works. And I'll show you also in this verse how private interpretation and whole denominations can start. But we don't want to go down that road, but Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to start in verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. And then I stop and I say, well, what's the good seed? Then all of a sudden, one guy raises his hand and says, I know what good seed is. Good seed is the good works that mankind does in the world to help mankind. Another guy goes, no, 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 no. I know what good seed is. The good seed is, well, Jesus Christ being here on earth and teaching God's word. That's the good seed. Another person goes, no, 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 no. The good seed is the Word of God. As people hear that Word of God, that's the good seed. Now what do we have here but three denominations, right? Because of what? Because they're guessing. That's been the problem with mankind. That's been the problem throughout the ages. There's just all kinds of guessing, all kinds of thinking. Well, you know what? I say, stop guessing. (laughs) Stop thinking. Just read the Word and let the Word of God interpret itself. There's no time that I have a right to go, well, I think it means this. We have to let it say what it means and mean what it say. So let's continue reading. And that's how you do it, by reading the whole context. Okay, so this guy comes, this man, which soweth good seed unto his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Well, the enemy came and put tares amongst his wheat. What a, that's not a good thing to do. Unloving. Verse 26. But when the <coughs> blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, there appeared the tares also. So the servants of that household came and said unto him, him Sir, Does not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath the tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And he said, Nay, least while ye gather up the tares, ye read up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together into harvest. And at the time of harvest I will say unto the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them into bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat unto my barn. And verse 31 says, Another parable spake, put he forth unto them. 
So does do we know what the good seed is yet? No. We don't know. It didn't say there, right? It didn't even tell us. Look at verse 36. What happens? It goes on to another parable. So do we know what the good seed is? So if you don't know what the good seed is, just keep reading. No guessing. No trying to figure it out. But look at verse 20, 36. It says, And when Jesus sent the multitude away and went unto his house, he went into his house, he's hanging out, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. His disciples were smart already. They didn't try to guess. They said, hey, tell us, tell us. Well, let's see what it says in verse 37. He answered and he said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the what? Son of man. Can you get any plainer? The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. So what's the good seed? It's the, it's the children of the kingdom. Remember that example? None of those things were it. None of them were it. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Can you get any plainer? The enemy. Does anyone want to guess who the enemy is? No, is the right answer. But if we read, we'll see. The enemy that sowed them is the what? Devil. Devil. The harvest is what? The end of the world. And the reapers are what? The angels. Then you start to know what this parable is about. Why? Because it's in the context as we read in God's word. Look at verse 40. And uh, as therefore the tares are gathered and, and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. So now we know what the end of the world will be like. How did we learn this? We learn this by the context, by reading. We, by reading God's word. Just letting it lay out for us. You know something? As you're reading God's Word and you see something that you don't know the answer to, the answer to finding that answer is to keep reading. Just to keep reading. Somewhere, sooner or later, God will tell you in His Word. And if He never tells you, you know what? You will never know. But guessing has been the curse of the Christian church. People just love to guess. Let's have a Sunday school class and we'll all guess on what it means. Instead of letting the word speak for itself, I got to tell you a story. Go to uh, Acts chapter seven, and I I just think of this story and I think it's worth telling. I had a friend of mine that told me this story, and this this friend of mine was was well versed in the word of God. He belonged to Christian uh, athletes, crusade athletes, you know, the thing they have in churches and stuff. He was just really well versed in the word of God and he went to a Bible fellowship like that we have here in the home and he was sitting there and the guy up front was teaching God's word and he came to this verse here in Acts chapter 7 verse 56 and it says and he said behold I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And the guy that was teaching that meeting looked right at him and said, Why was the, why was the Son of Man standing? And he goes, oh, oh, I don't know. He goes, That's right! If God's Word doesn't tell you, you don't know. I always got a kick out of that story. And he goes, And I didn't know the answer and I was right. <laughs> it always, and I always liked that story because he was like, I don't know. And he was right. <laughs> You know why? If the scripture doesn't interpret itself in the verse or in the context, you know, then another way it interprets itself is where it's been used before. But if God's word doesn't tell you, we have no reason to guess. If he doesn't, if you don't know, you know what the best answer is? I don't know. I'll tell you another story or another thing that I see all the time. It says in God's word that that he knows before we pray the things we need. It says that, right? And it also says to pray. God asks us to pray. 
Well, why? This is the question that's asked all the time. Why do we have to pray if God already knows what we need? You know what the answer is? I don't know. I don't know. It says to pray. That's all I know. It says to pray. That's the answer. I don't know. I don't try to guess. I don't go, hmm, well, let me tell you what I think. I don't know. You know what my answer is? I don't know. I'm right on that one. I don't know. I'm not saying that there's not an answer you might be able to find in your research, but I don't know. So I'm not going to guess. I'm not going to make it up. That's what some people do. They have a, 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 some knowledge of God's Word, and someone will ask them a question. And they don't want to look stupid, so they'll go, Well, I think it means this. I try very hard never to use the words, I think it means. I don't mind saying, I don't know. I'm not going to guess on God's Word. But if someone <laughs> asks me something, some question about healing available, you know what I'm going to say? Yes. You know why? I know it's true. I could read it to them if I had to. Sometimes I do. But if the scripture doesn't interpret itself in the verse or in the context, the story around it, then the interpretation can be found in previous usage or where it has been used before. But I write in my notes that Bibles are like dictionaries. They are, because you can, if you come across a word and you don't understand what that word means, you can look at the first usage of that word. You can look up where words were used before. You can look up where a word is used, like that Greek word idios, and you can look up every usage of that word and get a real good understanding of what that word means by looking at every usage of that word, or even groups of words. The first usage of a word is very important. It expresses an idea, an expression, and the explanation is usually complete enough to carry throughout the entire Bible. If God ne ever changes the usage of a word or an expression, he always explains it. And to show you this one, I want to go to Genesis, right at the beginning, easy to find, in verse, chapter 1, verse 5. And it says, And God called the night day, and the darkness he called night. Now let me ask you something. I mean, I'll ask you and tell you. The darkness is called what? Night. night. The light is called? Day. Throughout the entire Bible, that will be true. And look at this next phase. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And in Bible reckoning of time, they start their day at sunset. There will be records in God's Word when we'll see, like, they will become very important, like on the Passover or the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They needed to get things done. They needed to get him buried before the, before the sun went down because then it would start the next day. So in biblical reckoning of time, they start at sunset. That starts the next day. It's pretty neat, huh? And it, and it's, and it remains true throughout the entire Bible. The meaning is carried out through the entire Bible, and it will not change unless God changes it. God, in His Word, changes it. This is true of all the truths in God's Word. That's why a Bible is like a dictionary at times. The first time it's used, and that will give you the meaning of the Word. We're now going to get into the subject of figures of speech in the Bible. At times when I meet people and they hear that I let the Word of God speak for itself, they would say, Oh, so you take the Word of God literally. I usually answer, No, I take the Word of God accurately. One way to understand the Bible accurately is to understand figures of speech that are used in the Bible. So, to get started in this, I'd like to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is a verse that we've looked at before. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. The verse goes like this. It says, And all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, 
for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But here it's talking about all scripture. And it says, is given by inspiration of God. Those five words given by inspiration of God translated from one Greek word. And that Greek word is theopanoustos. And this word is a compound word composed of two root words. Theo, meaning God, and panoustos, meaning breathe. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Is literally can be the same as all scripture is God breathe. So when you see that God breathe, you have to ask yourself a question, or I was asked this question, does God breathe? Now, me and you breathe, people breathe, animals breathe, but God doesn't breathe. See, God is spirit, it says in John 4.24. And God has no form or comeliness. He doesn't have arms or tentacles. You might have seen some pictures like this, but that you know, but God doesn't. He's his spirit. He's invisible. But in the Bible at times it will give God characteristics of humans. So it'll say God bears his arm for you. That means he takes that outer cloak and moves it back so his arms are bared. It means he's fighting for you. I often think of that of Saul because Saul when David and Goliath situation, Saul didn't bear his arm anywhere. But David did. And he literally did. He went with just the sling. But that's a figure of speech. It's a figure of speech because God doesn't, isn't, doesn't have human characteristics. Whenever the Bible contributes human characteristics to God, it does this through figures of speech. And figure of speeches in the Bible is God's marking as to what God wants to emphasize. You might have asked yourself, well, what's important? What's really important in God's Word? Now, we, in my Bible, I underline things and put little letters and numbers and stuff. Well, God did it for us with the figures of speech. He emphasizes things for us to actually to slow down. It makes your mind slow down. You go, huh, what does that mean? That type of thing. So figures of speech are legitimate grammatical uses which depart from the literal language or regular grammar structure to call our attention to it. It slows down our minds and it makes us take a second look as to what has been written. We use figures of speech all the time in our American language, English language. But we know lots of figures of speech. Like if it's raining like crazy, right? Sometimes we say it's raining cats and dogs. Well, we've never, I've seen it, and I've never seen dogs and cats fall from the sky. So it's a figure of speech that we know easily, know them very easily. Or it's real dry, like the, the earth is thirsty. It's, it's not literally thirsty, is it? But it's a figure of speech that we know. And sometimes when I hear these figures of speech, I laugh my head off. <laughs> but that's a figure of speech. It, it's not literal. But a lot of times... That these things give you a, a better mind picture than just the true fact of it. Like if the, the earth is thirsty. I mean, you get a picture of it being really dry, you know. If I said, well, the earth is dry, you go, yeah, so what? It'll rain tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it, it sort of works on our minds that way. It's pretty cool. So when you see something like that in God's it makes you slow down your mind. And if you know what the figure of speech is, it slows it down. If you don't know what it means, it slows your mind down. You go, huh, I wonder what that means. And maybe you could look to find the answer to some of those things. Yeah, it's just wonderful. 
The Bible is to be uh, accepted literally whenever and wherever possible. But when a word or words fail to be true to fact, they are figures of speech. Figures of speech have a godly design emphasizing which must be grasped and understood in order to fully obtain the impact of the Bible. So that's why it's important to know about figures of speech and to study figures of speech. I've heard that there are over 212 figures of speech in the Bible. And sometimes there are as many as 40 different variations in one figure. How many do you know? Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't know that many when it comes to that number. But you can see that this is a really opportunity for research in the field of figures of speech. I'd like to show you some more so that we can start to see them. And whenever I teach, I, would, I like to share the figures of speech and point them out when I teach. I might not always do that, but it's good to do that so you can start to see them. All the students, if God's word, can start to see them. Oh, that's a figure of speech. I would like to handle in our study of figures of speech three figures of speech that deal with comparisons. The first one is simile. A simile is a comparison by resemblance. In the simile, the key words are as and like. For an example, the lawyer is like a fox. Well, he's not really a fox, but he's like one. He's sly, he's crafty, he's mysterious. The second figure of speech I'd like to handle is metaphor. And a metaphor is a comparison by resemblance, where one thing is declared to be another thing. For example, the lawyer is a fox. In the metaphor, we look for one thing that is declared to be another thing. And the third figure of speech that I'd like to get into is called hypocatastasis. In the Greek, which is a comparison by implication, it's where you would simply look them straight in the eye and say, you fox or sometimes just fox. Out of these three, the hypocatastasis is, is the one that most arouses the mind. It attracts and it excites the attention to the greatest degree. And it has the most impact of the three that we're looking at this morning. Another thing that I'd like to point out is that in the English language, where the educators, songwriters, poets, and others, whenever there's a figure of speech that they don't really understand, they call it a metaphor. Really, as a matter of fact, every figure of speech to them is a metaphor. Now I'd like to look at some examples from the scriptures. And in Psalms 1, the first psalm, the first psalm that we're going to look at, Psalm 1, and in verse 3, and it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that shall bring forth his fruit in his season, and his leaves also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall profit. Isn't that neat? He'll profit. He'll profit him. See, he's not a tree but he's like a tree, and it tells you here how he's like a tree, and that he'll bring forth fruit in his season. His leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. We'd all like to be like the tree by the river, right? And in verse 4 he says, The ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Like the chaff. The chaff is unuseful. It's useless, the chaff of the plant. 
And it says it is driven away in the wind. What they would do when they harvest the grain is they would beat it and then they would throw it in the air and the wind would take the chaff and blow it away because it was so much lighter than the grain, the good part of it. So that's how that figure of speech is used in scripture. Pretty wonderful and neat, huh? I'd like to go to the Gospel of John and show you the metaphor. John chapter 15. And as we're turning there, I'd like to point out that the Gospel of John has a tremendous amount of figures of speech in it. It'd be a great book to study to really hone up on figures of speech. But in chapter 15, in verse 1, it says, I am the true vine. This is the figure of speech. And in verse 5, it also says, I am the vine. Twice it's talked, Jesus is comparing himself by representation to the wine, where one thing is declared to be another thing. And the point of the comparison is explained in the context. So we'll, we'll, we will read the context. I am the true vine. This is Jesus Christ speaking. And my father is the husbandman or the cultivator, or the farmer. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, or he prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. If you got a little fruit, God will prune you so you can bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except you abide in me. When we abide in Jesus Christ, we are fruitful. That's what the comparison is. And then in verse 5 it says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. You can see that in the context, it explains the comparison. It explains it. If we stay with God and stay with Jesus Christ, we'll be fruitful. And if we don't, we won't. That's what the... The, the figure is pointing out to us it is just a wonderful thing. I'd like to show you one more metaphor, and that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So take your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and in verse 4 it says, But all did drink that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, that should follow them. What was that rock that was going to follow them? It says, that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. One thing is, to, is declared to be another. A comparison by representation. Christ here is compared, represented, right, as the rock. Pretty neat. That's a figure of speech. Now, going back to the Gospel of John, chapter 2, I'd like to show you one here that is a hypocatastasis. And in chapter 2, and in verse 19, and it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. This temple is the figure by implication. That's a hypocalostasis, a comparison by implication. It's not a simile. My body is like a temple. It's not a metaphor, which would be, my body is the temple. But hypocalostasis, by implication, by implication. Pretty wonderful and neat. I have two books that I have utilized extensively to help me understand figures of speech because I don't understand them that well. I am not an English major, 
but I'm starting to as I see them come up. And one is the book, Figures of Speech Used in the Bible by E. W. Bullinger. A, a simple search would give you plenty of resources to find the book, to look at and to purchase. And another book that has helped me immensely is Go Figure, An Introduction to the Figures of Speech in the Bible by Julia B. Hans. And to get more information or to order the book, there's a website, www.baystatebiblefellowship.org. And I will have both of these resources in my notes for you to be able to find them. In the next episode, we're going to learn how we got our modern Bibles.